Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are really excited to be here today. My name is Melissa Nahn, President and CEO of the American Composers Orchestra, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's professional development session. This is part of a series that we are presenting in connection with our Earshot Composer Advancement Programs and in partnership with the American Composers Forum. Today's session is titled Orchestra Unions 101, and I'm joined today by two wonderful panelists, Alina Dubinets and Joe Kluger. A high profile artistic leader and music scholar, Elena Dubinitz was appointed artistic director of the London Philharmonic Orchestra from September 2021, having previously held top artistic planning positions at Atlanta and Seattle Symphony Orchestras. In 2018, she was named one of Musical America's Professionals of the Year. And Joe Kluger, who is a principal of Wolf Brown, has over 30 years of experience as an arts and culture executive and consultant in strategic planning, organizational collaboration facilities development, governance, executive coaching, executive compensation and succession planning for nonprofits, and also is a phenomenal consultant with respect to media rights. So really benefited from his expertise over the last year. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation and wanted to share a few reminders at the start of today's session. Uh, you can use the Q&A button below the video to submit your questions to the panelists or to raise your hand if you'd like to join us on screen um, to ask your question in person. We will also have questions answered throughout the session today, so you're welcome to raise your hand or ask a question at any time and we will call on you. And you're also welcome to use the chat function to interact with your fellow attendees. This panel will be recorded and available on ACO's YouTube channel and on ACF's website. And before we begin, I'd also like to thank those who made today's series possible. The Stephen R. Gerber Trust, American Composers Forum, Virginia B. Tolman Foundation, New York State Council on the Arts, New York City Department Department of Cultural Affairs, our individual donors, and of course, our ACO staff, Lindsay Working, Aidan Feltkamp, Stephen Baer, Derek Bermel, and Sydney Cusick. So thank you so much for being here today. We greatly appreciate it. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Joe and Alina. Welcome and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. Well, today's session is on orchestra unions, and this is a very, very big and broad topic. Um, we're inviting both of you, Joe, I know that you've had a phenomenal amount of experience, both as a leader of an orchestra, a consultant, and also um, with the EMA now, um, negotiating media rights at the national level. And Alina, I know that your experience really touches on this from the perspective of artistic planning and administration, um, what it takes for an orchestra to manage these relationships in the creation of new adventurous artistic work. So really the way we're framing this conversation, um, the piece of the conversation that's around um, orchestra unions is about the intersection of union relationships and musician agreements with the creation of new artistic work. So how does that um, impact some of the work that composers do with orchestras with respect to writing new pieces, delivering them, rehearsing them, and of course, performing and recording them. So that's the lens through which today's conversation will take place. And I know we've prepared a number of materials for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen first so that we can go ahead and get started today. And we're going to start off with a few definitions. So essentially, the goal here is first to understand um, what the musicians union is. So Joe, I want to bring this to you first. Um, share a little bit about the AFM, the American Federation of Musicians, um, what that entity is and what it is meant to do. So the American Federation of Musicians is a national umbrella structure that represents really all unionized musicians in the United States in setting national principles and guidelines by which musicians are employed in orchestras. Um, they also on an active basis negotiate terms and conditions for electronic media activities that take place outside a local area. That's particularly recordings and streaming and other activity like that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in greater detail. What's interesting about the and we use the acronym AF of M here, is that there are also local chapters of the union in each city uh, or in each region. And those entities that are, think of them as affiliates of the national AF of M are separately incorporated and they are responsible for negotiating collective bargaining agreements that govern wages and working conditions for musicians, for rehearsals, concerts, 
and local digital media activities. And those are negotiated either directly with an orchestra management team. Um, but in some cases, if your piece is being performed by a per service orchestra that's just a pickup group or isn't necessarily employing musicians on a long term basis, um, sometimes a local union will set uh, minimum rates and conditions and then an employment group will decide whether to use them or not. But essentially you've got an umbrella structure on a national level that works cooperatively with individual local organizations and what governs the work, the, the, comp the new composition that you might write that gets performed for the first time or as a repeat performance is partially rehearsals and concerts are covered by the local CBA, the local collective bargaining agreement and to the extent it is recorded and distributed, um, it's usually the local CBA that covers local radio and television broadcasts, if there are any, but it's the national agreement and the national FFM that governs terms and conditions for distributing that content outside the local area in which the performance takes place. Just um, two other groups of, of people that you need to be aware of when you, when you come into a community and, you, and are preparing a work, um, you have an agreement, a contract that governs a lot of how the work is done and um, there are rules and regulations about that, but there's a, usually an orchestra committee, musician representatives within the orchestra that work closely with the management or in, in that organization to interpret the agreement, to help you understand, okay, the rule says the rehearsal has to start at such and such a time and it has to have a break in between and so a lot of issues get addressed in terms of how those rehearsals take place whether you can have overtime or not um, issues relating to instrumentation all of those sometimes require interpretation of what not only a contract says but what it's intended and lastly maybe one of the most important people to to, to get to know when you come into an orchestra environment is the personnel manager it's somebody on staff who keeps track of musicians and how they are assigned to rehearsals and concerts. They're in charge of hiring substitutes and extras, particularly if you need a, an unusual instrument performed. Um, and their job is to keep track of the administration of the agreement. I tell managers and union representatives with whom I work that there are certain guiding principles that should apply to all of these situations. Um, even though there's a contract and sometimes there are tensions in the negotiation of those things, but the successful relationships are built when the musicians and managements and the union all have and are working towards a shared set of goals and objectives. When people involved in the system honor, are honoring the intent of the agreements as well as the letter of them, and they're not trying to, you know, uh, take shortcuts or take advantage of ambiguities. And the keys to good relationships are listening, being transparent, direct and honest, and always making sure you understand what the other parties to that agreement want, the why of what's in, in those agreements. Yeah, that's really great advice. And we had a session a few weeks back on commissioning agreements and consortia. So a lot of this is really reinforcing and echoing a lot of that, um, as well as our last session with Aaron Curtis, where we were talking about the different relationships that you need to have within the orchestra. So it's great to have that personal manager highlighted as someone else who was really good to get in touch with and get to know as part of the process as well. And I want to dig into one quick thing for clarification. So you mentioned honor the intent and the language of an agreement. Can you share an example of how intent and language might be similar, but not the same? Um, I should have been prepared for that. And I, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll think about that as, the, as we go along and see if someone comes to mind. Um, it, I, I, I can speak to that more, more clearly when we get to some of the uh, uh, digital distribution agreements, where mm -hmm. I think there, there are some nuances. Rehearsals and concerts are usually more straightforward in, in determining what the rules and regulations are. Right. Um, it's more of a philosophical statement than a, than a specific one. 
than a practical one. But really, I think that that speaks very well to the first point, which is if both parties understand what we're there to do and what we're there to accomplish and what's important to the other party, it can be helpful to interpret the language in such a way that it's consistent with that. So there might sometimes be little twists and turns in legalese that, um, that might not be as tightly defined by those larger principles, but I think it's really great advice to keep those in mind. And then one last thing that I wanted to just ask, as we're thinking about the way that collective bargaining agreements are negotiated and what the union is there to do, you know, it's just like any other agreement or contract, which again, when we were speaking about what composers need to be thinking about in their commission agreements, oftentimes it tends to be informed by past experiences, right? So when a situation has occurred that gets in the way of musicians' ability to do their jobs well, oftentimes that comes into a collective bargaining agreement on the next round. So it sounds like a lot of what the AFM is there to do is to make sure that musicians have what they need to perform well, and that a lot of what they're looking at is the past precedent of things that have either um, stood in the way of that or facilitated that. Does that feel right, Joe? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and that's partly why I said, what's the intent of, a, of an agreement? Um, and management of orchestras that resolve problems when they come up are less likely to end up with 85 page contracts. Yeah, that's a really great piece of advice. Um, and so I want to come now to our next topic, which is really around the creation of new work. Um, and also, I want to come to Elena with these questions here. We have a lot of terms in a CBA or collective bargaining agreement that really do touch on the steps in the process that are typical for a commission or for a performance of a work by a living composer. And oftentimes, a composer might not know what all of those are, which is one of the reasons why we're coming into this session. So I'm really grateful to have you here to speak about this from the perspective of artistic planning um, and program development. So I wonder if you can share a little bit about how some of the typical terms in the CBA um, govern and impact programming for the orchestra. Happy to. First of all, thanks for having me here. It's exciting to be able to share some knowledge about this process. Uh, and it's also my assumption that you have covered some of these elements when you were talking about the commissioning agreements, because many of these points should be negotiated as part of um, uh, those uh, uh, agreements, either between the composer and the orchestra directly or between the publisher or an agent. Now many composers have um, managers and they negotiate with the orchestras. So some of it might sound familiar and stop me if I'm repeating uh, stuff that you already know and don't want to hear again. But I'll start with some basic stuff. Uh, notification timelines and um, timelines for changes. Um, what, what's really important to understand is that the orchestra is inflexible. It's a slow machine. We need to uh, prepare for everything very, very early. It's a really big, um, you know, um, uh, a steam train that uh, is slow to start and slow to finish. And what happens uh, in the middle of the ride is also quite slow. So um, uh, if a composer um, suddenly decides to change something within that timeline, it affects many constituencies within uh, the organization. And it's really important to understand it from the get-go. Um, every orchestra will have slightly different um, timelines for their pre uh, preparation process. Um, what I'll be sharing is general information for, let's say, um, major American and European orchestras that plan their seasons about two years out. Typically, uh, when a piece is placed on the program uh, uh, for um, an upcoming season or for two seasons out, we start preparing for getting the music at a certain time. And uh, at some point, the conductor uh, and the soloist will, will want to start learning the piece. So normally we ask the composers to send us the first draft of the piece about uh, six months out, six months before the performance, but no later than four months uh, out. And I would say that it's a very, um, um, important guideline 
for your work. If you get uh, delayed with uh, your processes, um, uh, the orchestra might actually decline playing your piece if it's a major orchestra. Uh, they might want to postpone because their uh, preparatory process will be disturbed. So four months out is your final deadline, so to speak. However, you can continue working on small details a little longer and typically three, three months out is when the very final score and the parts are required because the librarians need to start working on the bowings and marking the parts and preparing um, practice parts uh, for, um, uh, for the musicians. And they usually, uh, librarians are um, no less important than personnel managers for the composers' processes because they're also um, unionized. They're often members of the union and you, we, you really need to follow the guidance that is provided by um, uh, the CBA of each orchestra in relation to the librarian timelines. But they're uh, usually your best friends as well. You, you want to um, uh, get to know them as early as possible in the process and trust, um, you know, win their trust and support because they will be helping you um, uh, when you are already on the ground for your uh, premiere. Um, it's a very important relationship for every composer. About eight weeks out, um, orchestras begin preparing um, the publicity materials. Of course, they will have posted some information online and print, printed in the season brochure, but typically more extensive information for uh, the program books is required about eight weeks before the performance. So uh, if you are planning to write a program note for your piece, uh, do it before, um, uh, before then. Uh, and also during the process, during the entire uh, process of composing a piece, you should be prepared to um, satisfy certain requests that might not be um, thought of as part of your regular processes, such as potential meetings with uh, donors, let's say if there is a sponsor supporting your commission, uh, they might want to see the score or, or the drafts uh, or um, talk to you or some of them enjoy um, meeting with you in an informal setting and they might ask you to play through your piece or play segments uh, of your piece, uh, which is um, sometimes embarrassing, but uh, you just should be prepared for it because it's becoming, um, uh, you know, uh, in the current economic climate, I should say, orchestras are becoming to ask for personal communications more and more. Now, uh, what's important to um, understand is that the instrumentation that you discuss uh, in your commissioning contract um, should not be changed later in this uh, in the process it can be changed and we will talk about how it can be done if you absolutely demand certain changes but ideally you should uh, specify the instrumentation when you are discussing your contract because it will reflect upon uh, who is hired for your performance how the doublings are um, uh, you know uh, identified and all additional elements will be discussed along these lines. For example, if you want the musicians to speak or whistle or let's say wear something like a hat or use any kind of a prop, it needs to be discussed at the time when you're um, uh, negotiating your contract. Because all of these things, believe it or not, um, can require additional payment and the management should be able to budget for it appropriately before you submit the score. It's too late to do it at that point. You know, uh, they might say no to you because you didn't satisfy the um, requirements of the commissioning agreement. Agreement if you start coming up with these additional elements later in the process. So think about it um, ahead of time. Um, now. If there are differences in instrumentation, um, for example, if you would like to add some instrument that is not normally used in that particular orchestra, let's say an oboe d'amour, um, 
it's really important to discuss uh, that instrument very early on in the process because some players might not be able to um, use that instrument, you know, that they might not have that instrument uh, and the orchestra would need to somehow borrow it or, you know, purchase it even. Um, so again, think it through very early uh, because um, it's not only your creative initiative that's, that gets engaged right here. It's only a ton of budgeting considerations that are also related to uh, CBA requirements. Um, now, due dates. Uh, uh, Joe already mentioned that um, um, some, of, some of them do exist in, in the CBAs, but uh, there might be some additional considerations that uh, you might want to know. Um, so whenever you are talking to an artistic administrator or a personnel manager um, who probably won't be your contact until the very last moment, uh, but perhaps you will be talking to a librarian very early, ask them about additional requirements that a particular orchestra might have. For example, when they put out their practice parts for the musicians, it can vary and it doesn't necessarily get specified in uh, CBAs. Um, typically it's about two weeks out, but it might be different. Um, now ask them if they allow for pencil markings or if they use electronic tablets. It's uh, not a common thing yet, but some orchestras, especially chamber orchestras do use them. And it's a very different process of preparing um, the parts and especially of marking the parts during the rehearsal process that you need to be aware of. Um, um, libraries often will want to keep the original copies of, uh, of your parts and scores for potential repeated performances later on. So you really need to pre-consider or your publisher should pre-consider how to share uh, your music with other orchestras. For example, if there are multiple co-commissioning orchestras as part of your uh, project, uh, the first orchestra uh, wouldn't necessarily lend your music to the following orchestra, which is somewhat counterintuitive, but sometimes situations like this do happen. So please keep it in mind and talk about it from the get-go. Um, sometimes copies could be made or sometimes the original scores could be lent to um, the other orchestras, but then they would need to be returned to the original orchestra, to the premiering orchestra. So just talk it through with um, your best friends, uh, librarians when you start working with them. Now, if you do envision changes, if you uh, cannot um, deliver this piece without uh, changing the instrumentation or um, any other element, please do talk to multiple um, people about it, not just to the conductor. Sometimes conductors can become uh, too busy. You know, they are busy people and they just might not think through all of the repercussions of your uh, changes. Please talk to the artistic administrators um, uh, in addition to the conductors. Even if you have the best possible personal relationships with the conductors, do talk to the administration and talk to the librarians. Um, now, when you start getting closer to submitting the parts, um, think about the process of bowings and how the revisions can be made. I already touched upon it, but um, uh, typically during the rehearsal process, um, you, you will want to be as close to the librarians as possible physically in terms of physical proximity to, the, um, uh, to where they are located in the building. And sometimes, uh, libraries are not even in the concert halls, you know, there are, uh, there are different situations for uh, each orchestra. Uh, what I recommend doing usually is setting up a librarian right behind uh, the stage or right in the wings so that you could run basically during the rehearsal and tell them something if you need an immediate change. And changes do happen all the time. Don't be afraid of it. I'm not trying to 
deter you from making changes to your, um, you know, uh, to your project if uh, you believe in um, in them. Um, but you just really have to communicate them very carefully. And what I um, suggest doing is um, um, when the changes get implemented for example if you have alerted the conductor the artistic administrator and the librarian about these changes try to ask them how they're going to communicate them to the musicians because you just don't want your information not to be shared appropriately at the last minute and what we have done at my previous orchestras was um, you know, simple stuff like posting some notes um, in the elevator when the musicians are riding the elevator uh, on the way to, to the uh, concert stage uh, area, you know, or of course you can email them, but sometimes they wouldn't check their email. So post some signage on, on the walls of the concert hall. It might sound silly, but it does help the process. You really want to be as clear as possible about your um, changes. Um, and always discuss the timeline. If changes do happen at the last minute, um, for example, if your piece um, was written in such a way that some musicians might not be able to deliver it. Um, uh, you know, if there are certain issues such as um, uh, you might have not pre-considered uh, some rests for the musicians to um, uh, for, for their hands to relax a little bit in the middle of a very long passage, they will tell you about it. And you know, I haven't uh, experienced um, uh, commissions when um, we had to uh, alter the instrumentation on the spot during the rehearsal uh, in order to somehow um, um, release the load of the musicians. We had to distribute one part between two musicians. I'm not going to name the composer or <laughs> the piece uh, when it was happening, but uh, it was a real life experience. So if it happens, um, talk to the musicians afterwards, express your feelings about it, apologize maybe. You do want them to be positively predisposed towards you before the actual concert, before the performance. They have to deliver um, your piece to the best possible results. And if you happen to make a mistake or if you just didn't think about something, um, it's to your advantage to um, be as, nice about it as possible. It's again, a silly a suggestion, but it does help the process sometimes. Um, what happens if you haven't um, finished your project in time? If you weren't able to complete uh, your project for any reason, health reasons, uh, you know, um, miscommunications, things happen. We all, we all are human beings and, you know, um, uh, postponements uh, happen all the time. Uh, first of all, again, talk to people, communicate very clearly about your reasons, uh, be as transparent as possible. It always help, uh, help, uh, helps um, for us, you know, to understand why you are doing certain things in a certain way. Um, and then ask about uh, potential options. Of course, it's um, uh, it, it, it's ideal if your premiere can be postponed, uh, let's say until the next concert, which is almost impossible uh, for major orchestras. Quite often they will offer you a slot on the following um, season. Uh, but you should remember that if your piece uh, was co-commissioned, um, some uh, pieces of the puzzle um, might change accordingly. For example, if the first orchestra had the premiere rights, would they now go to the second orchestra in line or would they still be retained by the first orchestra but a season later? But what if the second orchestra was in the middle between these two dates? 
uh, you should be able to navigate these issues to everybody's satisfaction. You don't want to upset orchestras because you want to continue working with them in the future. Same goes for uh, recording rights, for example. Quite often, uh, orchestras negotiate the recording rights early on, and Joe will talk about the media agreements later. What I'm saying now is that uh, sometimes uh, the premiere recordings um, uh, um, would, would be made only archivally and the proper recording for a CD release, let's say, would be negotiated uh, for another orchestra, especially if a composer um, is aware of his or her own uh, pre you know, predisposition to changes after the premiere. Quite uh, often composers do alter their scores after the premiere, and then they want to record the um, updated version and their publishers would negotiate it ahead of time. So again, what would happen if your initial performance gets postponed? Would the recording rights um, be kept uh, the way they had been negotiated or would they need to be um, changed? If your piece couldn't be postponed, if the orchestra decides to completely cancel your piece, um, what are your other um, options in this situation? Would you uh, transfer the premier rights to the next orchestra or would you be looking for the next orchestra or would you still try to convince the first orchestra? You know, all of these are um, essential questions for artistic planning and you should be thinking about them when you are negotiating your agreements and especially during your process. And what I'm trying to say here uh, again and again is that um, you should really try to satisfy the timelines that you have negotiated. Um, it's really not good practice to be late with um, any of this. Can I just ask one, I just want, thought of one other thing to highlight on this this topic back up to instrumentation one of the things that some composers like to incorporate into works these days is electronic elements so pre-recorded um, music that then gets um, added to a piece that's performed live you have to be really really careful about clarifying that issue in advance to make sure that what you are recording on an electronic basis is not displacing the employment of union musicians um, that's a very sensitive topic, and you really got to clarify that in advance with your commissioning partners. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. And I'll also say that quite often con con the conductors will, will be um, less excited about commissioning a piece when it includes an electronic element, because they might think that the synchronization issues could be required in this case. But, uh, of course, electronic components can work um, in multiple uh, forms and shapes. So be very clear how you are planning to use electronics and if it will require, uh, you know, uh, some sort of a click track and synchronization. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really great. And one of the things I really appreciated about way you, the way you framed this entire section is you're really outlining for us the many domino effects of any particular decision. So if you are late on one particular thing, marketing, librarian, you know, the, the parts getting to the orchestra musicians, the recording rights, the delivery of scores and the premiere dates for other orchestras, all of these things are implicated by that. So it's just really important to note that that's the case. Um, just to drive this point home a little bit further, thinking about doubling, you might not think it's that big of a deal to say, oh, I think a lot of contrabassoon today. Um, but I, I will say, that's a huge issue, especially from the perspective of an orchestra that is per service. Let's say that you're hiring for an orchestra and you know who you need based on the commissioning agreement. And you've hired a second bassoonist who is a wonderful bassoonist, but doesn't own or play contra. And all of a sudden the part is delivered and it has contra in it. Not only are you in an issue of having to deal with getting that instrument through the door, but you might have to be thinking about what would it mean to replace this person, which is awful. That's not at all what you ever want to see. It was a very, um, so, there's a very famous story. I don't remember the, the work, but the Boston Pops or the Boston Symphony played some work where the, the arranger or the composer wanted the musicians in the orchestra to play a, a rubber ducky. It was a second Sesame Street piece. And the union said, well, that'll require doubling because rubber ducky is not part of the individual. So that, that, that's a famous situation that requires 
clar clarifying these issues in advance. For sure, anything can be doubling. <laughs> so it's just important to realize that that's a cost and that's also a, um, can the can the musician do it? Is that the right person for the right job? So if you change it at the last minute, um, that can be an issue. Or if it's not clear and consistent with the commission agreement or the listing at the front of the score, if we find it partway through the score in a notation, that can also be an issue. And um, Alina or Joe, please feel free to hop in on this question. Um, I'm curious if you can let us know what the financial implications are of lateness. I've seen situations in which composers maybe charge some fees if that if those scores and parts are not delivered on time. I haven't seen situations like this, but your piece can be canceled, really. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, especially if there are marketing concerns, and right. uh, there, you know, there will always be marketing concerns in relation to any contemporary piece because. Um, of course, um, what we do when we program a contemporary piece, we use an, a so-called opportunity cost um, that could be utilized better in, from the perspective of our marketing colleagues quite often. You could place a Beethoven uh, symphony there instead and bring many more people as they think. Right. So they will push um, artistic administrators to reconsider if the piece is late and you know they um, can't get it in time for the performance. So yeah. you I mean, yeah. commission, the commissioning agreement is going to specify this, and usually there's you get a fee up for, at the front of the beginning, and then there's an additional fee paid when you deliver the score in part. So there's an incentive for composers to comply with those timelines. Some some composers are notoriously late. Um, but I think it's important to try to, to deal with it. I think on a, on a time issue, this may sound completely obvious, but if you are commissioned to write a 20 minute work, don't write one that's 40 minutes. Oh yes. Because the consequences of that in terms of rehearsal time and performance overtime are tremendous. I mean, it, yeah, it's it not a gift. obvious, but. <laughs> It's not a gift. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. And a couple of questions that are coming through in the Q&A window. Um, so Alina, you had mentioned that um, part preparation is a huge thing. And I know we talked about that with Aaron Kernis in our last um, session, that this is often the way in which musicians will get to know you is how that those materials are and also the librarian too. So the question here is, is it appropriate for the librarian to refuse materials that aren't prepared satisfactorily? In other words, if there are no page turns, the music's too small or too big or takes too many pages. So we're talking about how in a lot of agreements, you have to align with MOLA guidelines. Yes, and you have to do it. They will turn you um, away. You will have to run back home and redo everything last minute. You know, it's a really big issue, uh, especially in um, in the um, major American orchestras. They're just not. They don't have time to um, read your handwriting and to go through your scribbles. You know, re uh, these requirements are not random. They have been proven uh, by um, many years of um, uh, experience, um, uh, and it's really essential to satisfy them. Uh, if your font is too small, your musicians uh, will come and tell you that they can read your music. Uh, if the page turns are not um, organized very well, usually librarians will catch it ahead of time, but you will be adding uh, more work to their plate. And it's not a happy situation. You really need to think about all of this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. And um, just very briefly, because I know we have a lot more to get through. I know you mentioned that um, some orchestras are using PDF parts. Do you see more orchestras starting to do that? And um, do you see any differences in how parts are prepared? You know, it's still very expensive to um, um, to do it for large orchestras. Some of them have done it, but I don't see it um, happening on a regular basis um, in, in the near future. But if you're working with a chamber ensemble, then it's a reality, you know, it's um, what's happening right now. Many of them are using uh, PDFs and you cannot quite mark them effectively um, the same way um, you mark your paper copy using a pencil, you know, it's much more efficient to use a pencil. But of course, then you should be thinking about, um, uh, again, uh, how your 
original music is going to be used in the future. Uh, as you know, librarians usually erase the uh, pencil marks when they give uh, the music to, back to the publishers or to, uh, um, uh, to the next orchestra. Uh, if you make a copy from a paper copy with, um, with the markings, then the markings stay on, on the copy. You can't quite erase them at that point. So again, uh, you really need to pre-consider um, how the rehearsal process is gonna be organized. And if an orchestra does happen to use um, electronic tablets, you need to know about it and you need to plan for it um, in advance in terms of preparing the parts. Perfect. So um, I know we have a lot to get through in terms of media rights. So um, we did want to share a little bit about the rehearsal process itself. So Lena, if you could give us your top line pieces of advice on how to work through a rehearsal process, that would be lovely. Yeah, one of the pieces of um, uh, advice um, has just been shared by Joe. Do not exceed the um, length of the piece because it does affect um, the rehearsal plan. And I have been um, in multiple situations when uh, the concert length uh, just couldn't be extended and the composer would deliver a piece which would be much longer than what we had expected. And um, the orchestra would need to go into overtime and you know pay um, musicians much more. And also the... Um, uh, the attention span of the audience um, really need, needs to be considered um, from the get-go. And if you exceed your um, length, then it creates so many problems for, uh, for all of us on the other side that it's really not advisable. If you do need to change something, tell us ahead of time, uh, at least three months out so that we could adjust our you know, planning processes. Um, when the score is delivered or a draft score is delivered to the conductor, that's the moment when you should be starting uh, talking to the conductor and uh, the artistic administrator about a uh, rehearsal plan. Uh, because the length of the piece will affect how rehearsals are scheduled. Um, and uh, quite often um, the conductor will decide how many rehearsals the piece should have up, uh, uh, after seeing the initial draft. Um, and uh, I should just warn you that uh, typically um, you shouldn't expect, uh, especially if you are um, an up and coming um, Composer, you shouldn't expect that your piece will be rehearsed thoroughly. Um, you will only get um, a maximum of two rehearsals, maybe um, let's say half an hour each for a 10 minute piece. You know, um, uh, there are no rules here. I'm just um, uh, randomly naming some figures, but um, Joe, did you want to comment? Well, I wanted to say that because of that, you're dealing with orchestras that are very soon talented, sophisticated professionals, but you have to make sure that the piece you're writing is not so complex that, that it's not rehearsable in a couple in a couple of hours, as you as you outlined. I'll tell you one war story. When I was running the Philadelphia Orchestra, we commissioned Milton Babbitt to write a piece that was determined by several conductors to be unplayable. So we got to the rehearsals and it fell apart. It eventually got premiered by Gunther Schuller, but with a student orchestra where he had 24 rehearsals for it. So you've got really got to write something that it, even if it's sophisticated can be played and rehearsed in a relatively short amount of time. Right, and it, to me, I would say, know your partner, know your situation, right? Like where we ended with um, the session we did with Aaron Kernis was that in a typical commissioning and rehearsal situation, everything that Joe and Alina just shared is 100% true. If you want your piece to come off well, you've got to write it in such a way it's accomplishable in that period of time. And then I would also say that I hope that more orchestras will think about what it means to create more of a laboratory process. I know that's something ACO is doing. And if you find yourself lucky enough to be in that scenario, more adventurous things might be possible because you have the time to do them. So it's really just a question of the personality of the institution and how much time you know you have at the outset. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when the rehearsal process begins, um, it's already too late for prepare your piece properly. You really should be 
talking to um, uh, representatives from the orchestra very early and the order um, um, uh, of the rehearsal is quite essential for um, for you know for preparing your piece properly uh, quite often composers are able to convince the conductors to put their pieces at the top of the rehearsal process which is um, really um, a good advice I would say because it would not limit the conductor to the um, time that would um, that he or she could have at the end of the rehearsal, having rehearsed the rest of the program, right? Um, uh, they might have only, let's say, 20, minute, 20 minutes left for your piece and it wouldn't be enough. So try to push for an earlier slot. If they could start with your piece and spend, um, let's say, almost as much time as you would like them to spend on your piece, it's always a better uh, situation. Now, if you think that there should be sectionals in the piece, um, it's not gonna be your decision, it's a conductor's decision, but you could point it out to them. And I'll give you a very uh, good example that I am actually working on right now. Um, uh, London Philharmonic just announced their 22-23 season, so it's not a secret anymore. But we will be doing the UK premiere of a major um, orchestral cycle by Heiner Goebbels. Um, it's his new uh, piece, which is called A House of Call, which was premiered earlier this season by Ensemble Modern, and we'll be bringing it to London next season. He quoted a um, pretty substantial chunk uh, from a piece by Pierre Boulez. So what he's telling us right now is that we should allocate some rehearsal time um, prior to rehearsing his piece to prepare that section from Boulez, because as you know, Boulez's uh, language is very difficult. It's one of those situations that might happen that George just described to us. And the composer has been very proactive in letting us know that we really should plan our rehearsal process appropriately. And this is what I would recommend to all of you in every situation. Yeah, that's great advice. And I know we need to move on to media rights. Is there any last pearl of wisdom that you would give before we do? Um, well, um, probably um, Boeing's because you will want to work with the concert master if your piece is somehow involved in terms of um, Boeing's and again, establish that connection very, very early uh, in order to have a direct access to the performer. Of course, always in partnership with the conductor, but sometimes it does help to talk to the principals. That is beautiful advice. Thank you so, so much for all of the context and all of the understanding of how these relationships work really well together. Um, so Joe, I'm coming back to you. <laughs> this is your area of expertise on a national level. We'd love to hear a little bit more about um, digital projects, um, media rights, all of the things that we care so much about um, with respect to how work gets documented and shared. Right. So. Um... We're going to share this PowerPoint with you when we're finished, because as you'll see, following this kind of agenda slide, we've got a lot of material and there's not enough time to go through all of it. But I wanted to just kind of introduce the topic at both the, thir at the 30,000 or maybe the 10,000 foot level. Um, as you prepare for performances to be performed live for, for audiences, um, there is a tremendous opportunity to capture that performance um, for a variety of purposes. And so what I want to do is take you through the strategic overview of why that's valuable, how to make it happen, how to figure out how to navigate some really complex rules, particular union agreement rules about what you can capture, what you can distribute, how do you go about doing that, in order to accomplish your objectives. So let's just walk through this. I'm gonna kind of highlight what these slides are all about, but not, not take you through all of them. It's just too much information. So just kind of go, th go, through, go through the next one, Melissa. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is that the role that 
digital content has played in orchestras is not a new topic. Um, it's been around for decades. Um, but historically, it played a role, a secondary role. And it's, st it's still a secondary priority in the sense that we're in the business of presenting live performances. Um, but what's happened in recent years, even before COVID took place, you started to see orchestras take the position that the digital distribution of audio and audiovisual content is not just a night to have, but nice to have, but a core strategy for helping these organizations reach more people. For composers, it's a tremendous opportunity to document the work that you've created and to disseminate it to more people. Um, what's really happening in addition to that, and maybe this is the, one of the big takeaways from this discussion, is that in the old days, you would have a radio station or a record company or a television show um, that would take the initiative to make these things happen. And in the 21st century, it is the responsibility of the content creators, the musicians, the conductors, the composers, the managements of these institutions, that the, if they want this to happen, they've really got to take responsibility for initiating the projects. Okay, go to the next slide, um, which is just uh, to show you that there's a wide range of benefits to doing this. Um, some of them are, it used to be uh, a primarily an economic rationale for doing it. Today, the, the rationale for capturing uh, performances and distributing it is either an artistic one because you wanna document something or showcase something you've done that's unique or because you wanna use it as a way of marketing audiences, um, build, building, really reaching more people or using it to to market the live performance experience. Um, the economic benefits, while they might exist, if you have a, if you hit a home run, so if you'll forgive that analogy, um, generally speaking, these are not activities that are gonna displace or replicate or even replicate the economic uh, engine that goes with live performances. Okay, go to the next slide. The reason for focusing on these benefits is because when we advise orchestras and opera companies about how to undertake digital media projects, we, we want to really encourage them and we would encourage all of you as composers to focus on what your objectives are before deciding then how to undertake the planning that goes along with it. Whether you should release something just for streaming, whether you should make a physical CD, whether you should uh, try to be on television, whether you should try to focus just on reaching people in the local area where the performance takes place or reaching people globally, all of those issues around what the objectives are should be established before you decide what you're doing because the electronic media activity is a strategy to achieve some other objective. So these are just the steps that we encourage people interested in doing this to go through, to think through planning for these activities in the same way that you would plan for any concert experience. Um, okay, jump to the next section because maybe that's perhaps the most, uh, th this is where the rules and regulations need to be followed and if they're not followed can, can get in the way. Um, we advise organizations that are trying to capture content to make sure that you understand that you need permission from everybody. Yes, we, I can show you an 85 page contract that covers the terms and conditions for, music, for using musicians in a digital project. But you also need permissions from conductor, soloist, chorus. There's a whole group of people in the opera world. The stagehands have to, permission needs to be obtained. The venue in which the performance take place, if it's not owned by the orchestra, needs to have its permission obtained. And of course, representing composers, you are those of you who are on in this, who are composers have rights as well. And an institution that wants to make a project using your material, they need to obtain your rights, either um, statutory rights through blanket license agreements or voluntary license agreements with through your publisher. Um, as with the conversation we were having about how you go about planning for rehearsals and concerts, the key to the success is making sure that all of these permissions are obtained, that there are shared goals established in advance of the project even being discussed, and that the process for making decisions is collaborative. Okay, 
jump ahead. Um, let me just focus with the remaining time on, since this is a topic about orchestra union agreements, um, I put that other stuff first because even as it relates to orchestra union agreements, it, the, the way these um, agreements are structured, they require not just payment of fees, but you also need approval of the project from the musicians and or the orchestra committee. And that is more easy to obtain when you have open conversations in advance about what the goals and objectives are. Um, as we said at the very beginning of this session, you have a local, an AFM local that, or a CBA that governs local radio and television activities, but all of the other electronic media activities that you might want to do in connection with the capturing and distributing of a new work are governed by some national agreement with the AFM American Federation of Musicians, the National Union. Um, there are a variety of those different agreements. The ones that apply, the one that applies in most cases to the work of symphony orchestras and opera companies um, is the integrated media agreement that is either one um, that was negotiated by this consortium of 120 symphony and opera orchestras that actually I represent um, that has its own integrated media agreement. Uh, or in some cases, there are some institutions that aren't part of this 120 uh, member institution and they have their own agreements with AFM. Um, and in some cases, if you're with an opera company, there's subcontracting orchestra. Bottom line is there's a roadmap here. If you need help following it, I'm happy to talk to any composers or publishers after the fact and help you follow the, follow the, the rules to make sure you're working with the right agreement. Okay, move ahead. Um, I'm not gonna, I don't think we should cover this today, but what included in this material is an overview of the terms and conditions, the key ones in the integrated media agreement that applies to most orchestras in this country. This is just a series of describing what, what kind of content can be released free without payment to musicians under uh, some news and promotional uses. Jump to the next slide. Um, there's actually two slides of this. I'm not gonna read it to you, it's just too much information, but there's, a, there's a, a menu of options here that enables content to be released for free. And the next slide covers the basic structure. If you want an entire work captured and distributed, there is a clause in this agreement that allows the content to be released in all audio or audio visual formats other than television um, upon the payment of a single upfront fee to the, each musician. And this describes what the fees are. And the key to this is, um, as it says at the very bottom, two, two key philosophical points. One is that the employer of the musicians, the orchestra or the opera company must own and control, must be the copyright owner of the content in order to get these discounted rates. Um, and the orchestra committee of musicians has to approve the project. So if you are interested in having your work recorded, um, if it's just for art, actually go to the next page, last slide here. Um, if you're interested in an archival tape, you can sign an agreement with the orchestra that gives you access to that tape for your personal use. Um, if you want to have an excerpt of that recording released for promotional purposes, it needs to meet some very, very strict rules and regulations. I put, didn't punt them on here, but there's probably seven or eight rules and conditions that have to be met, and it requires approval of the orchestra committee. If you want to have an entire work distributed, um, you have to really identify who's got responsibility for making it happen, who's, who's responsible for raising the production costs to, to make the recording. Um, and you've got to resolve all, recommend resolving all these things, not at the last minute, but if possible, at the time the commissioning agreement is resolved, because the sooner you, you can resolve some of these key philosophical points, the more time you have to plan for it to be executed and implemented properly. That was brilliant. On, I could go on for another hour. <laughs> and I would sit and listen in, in rapt silence because honestly, Joe has been one of the most um, incredibly knowledgeable 
and important people in my first year at ACO, just from the perspective of being able to understand what these rights look like. Um, I recognize as the leader of an organization whose primary purpose is discovery and development of composers who will expand the definition of American orchestral repertoire, that this piece of it, the recording and the ability to um, get that music out there for others who will want to listen to it and program it and commission you in the future is one of the most important things we can do. So being able to navigate these agreements successfully, and as you said so clearly, understand the purpose, the reason why we're doing this is one of the most important things towards creating successful agreements. So Joe, thank you so much for all of the things you are doing to advance this in our field. We are very, very grateful to you. Um, and so I want to, we're just at time now, I want to take this opportunity to thank both Joe and Alina for sharing their wisdom with us. Um, we couldn't be more grateful to have you here with us today. And um, also for helping us to clarify and demystify some of the things that maybe composers might not fully understand until there is a problem. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be proactive and well-informed um, so that we can all be great partners to one another. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, and I'd like to welcome Aiden back to the screen to close us out. And thank you to everyone who's watching. We greatly appreciate each and every one of you for being here and learning with us today. And we'll make sure that this is available to you as well as all of the resources after today's session. Thank you so much to Mosa and to our amazing, amazing panelists. Thank you for sharing with us today. Again, a thank you to our donors who made this happen. The Virginia B. Toolman Foundation, the Stephen R. Gerber Trust, NISCA, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. If you would like to find out about our future events such as this, please be sure to sign up on our newsletter at AmericanComposers.org. And this will be followed up with email, with resources, and with the recording of today's event so that you can follow up. We'll also be sharing a survey link so you can let us know how we did with this and what other topics you'd like us to cover in the future. And Melissa and I will be on Discord for the next 15 minutes answering your questions. So if you'd like to join us over there, just follow the link and we will be happy to answer your questions. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.